everyone, it's me, Aaron, and this is Comic Class, the show on this channel every single week in which we just geek out about comic books, and October has finally come to a close. Mean that our month-long look at the best in horror comics has finally ended, and we can now return to talking about the big new releases every single week. Unless, I don't know, you guys want me to keep talking about horror comics, I mean, just throwing it out there, but Joe Hill's Basket Full of Heads just came out, and that was pretty good. I mean, I guess if you guys really want me to, I could talk about that for an entire episode. And no, everyone's sick and tired of me talking about horror stuff for an entire month, and you're all going to unsubscribe if I talk about horror comics for literally one more day. Cool, 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 cool. So what else is going on over at DC? Yes, today we are talking about the big new release coming out from DC, Legion of Superheroes number one. Now, this is a return to a series that a lot of people have been asking for, a lot of people have been excited about the idea of this team finally returning, because Legion of Superheroes have a long history. They've been one of those teams that have been a vital part of the history of DC Comics, and yet, they kind of have an interesting history with DC Comics. Because they're not one of those teams that has always stuck around. They kind of come around, and they're brand new and different every single time. Then they take a massive break. And then it seems to go on until the exact moment when everyone forgets about them. Then they come right on back with some big new creator. Creating a brand new version of that team. Going in a brand new direction. Because this is a team of heroes set in the 31st century. So... You know, the timeline keeps changing, and if little things change here, it has a big effect on the future, so it kind of creates a lot of possibilities for different creators to come in here and just really do whatever they want with this team. And now, the new creator in charge of it is Brian Michael Bendis. Yes, you all know my history with Brian Michael Bendis. No need to point that out in the comments. Yeah, let's go ahead and address this right off the bat. Yes, I personally, I'm not really a fan of Brian Michael Bendis. I've said this many times before, but I think the guy has a lot of really cool ideas. But I never really agree with his execution. And this is a book that already kind of had, I'm not going to say controversy, because controversy implies that something was going on behind the scenes that was raising problems with this book. No, nothing like that. But more of people were just kind of hesitant going into this thing because of certain things that have been happening in the books leading up to this that people had already kind of been questioning. One of the things being that the new protagonist, if there is such a thing as a protagonist in a Legion of Superheroes team, is a team made up of like 30 or 40 different characters, which is one of the things I always found to be really cool about the Legion of Superheroes, is that it's basically the superhero team for the United Nations of space in the future. So it's basically a collection of heroes made up from every single different planet out there, and every single one of them just represents their own planet. So it's that idea of everyone coming together. It's a great idea. It's kind of like Star Trek, but with superheroes. So I always found them to be really cool, but they needed someone to be the central focus of this book. So of course, they kind of went back to the roots of the Legion of Superheroes, which was that Superman, when he was a child, ended up joining this team. Now, they were taking Superman's actual child, Jonathan Kent, and having him be that person that they plucked up from the past and brought to their timeline to be a member of their team. Okay, that's pretty cool. But people are already kind of hesitant about the way that Brian Michael Bendis has been treating Jonathan Kent. Because Jonathan Kent was this character that so many people fell in love with when he was introduced. And then Brian Michael Bendis came in here and just picked that character up and sent him away on a long trip with his grandfather out in space. And when he returned, several years for that character had passed. And Superman ended up missing a giant chunk of his own son's life. That's kind of devastating. And it wasn't just devastating to Superman, it was devastating to the readers because we liked this character. We liked where he was, and we wanted to see him slowly progress from the point that he was at to being the adult that he would eventually become. And we kind of missed all that. We kind of just got, nope, it happened right now. Bam, he's now a teenager. Look at that. Five freaking years just passed. Like that. Yeah, none of that stuff was important. You didn't actually need to see it. It's the impact. The impact of actually seeing him at that age. That's the important thing. Not really. 
No, it's more of actually seeing him get to that point. That's more of, it's kind of about the journey, not really so much the destination. That's kind of what all comics are sort of about. Otherwise, I would just read the spoilers online for what happens in every single one of these issues rather than forking out four bucks every single week for another copy of it. Anywho, I'm starting to go down a dark path, and that's not what this channel is about. But the other, I don't want to say controversy with this book, but kerfuffle, the kerfuffle with this series is that we all know this is not the Legion of Superheroes that we were supposed to be getting. Because we all know that over in the Doomsday Clock series, they were setting up a completely different Legion of Superheroes team. Over in Doomsday Clock, they were dealing with all the stuff that got erased from the continuity of the DC Universe in the New 52, including the Legion of Superheroes, maybe, kind of, sort of. It was never really all that clear whether or not the Legion of Superheroes were supposed to exist in the New 52, but this one was coming in here and going, no, 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 let's clear this all up and let's say, yes, the Legion was forgotten about. We're gonna come in here and this is going to be the series that reintroduces them. This is gonna be the setup for a brand new Legion of Superheroes book and we got Jeff Johns, that guy who you trust with all your DC properties, he's coming in here to handle all that stuff. But then the book got delayed and then delayed again, then delayed, delayed further, and eventually it got to a point where Liz and DC just said, yeah, we're kind of sick and tired of waiting on this new Legion of Superheroes book. Let's just go ahead and make it. And Bendez, Bendez has got a pitch for it. So we're just going to let Bendez go ahead and write that book. And spoilers for Doomsday Clock number 11. They kind of came in here in that issue and just went, yeah, you know all that stuff that we were set up with the Legion of Superheroes? Uh, Thanos snap. <sighs> Dust away. Didn't matter. Now, I'm not going to come in here and say, well, I know exactly what they were planning to do with the Legion of Superheroes in that book, and it was not this, because I don't know what they were planning on doing in that book. I don't, and it would be irresponsible for me to come in here and say that I knew that they were planning to do something completely different with this. But man, it really feels like they were. It really feels like this was not the plan for Legion of Superheroes, so yeah, this book already kind of has two, I'm not going to say strikes, but... It's got two little things on your shoulder there as you're reading it, just constantly reminding you, yeah, think about this as you're reading this thing. And I couldn't help it. I couldn't help but think about those things as I was reading this book. But I will say, picking up this actual issue and going through it, I do have to give Bendis credit, is that he has got some really cool ideas in here. But Bendis always has really cool ideas and as I mentioned earlier, my problem with business has always been not the ideas, but the execution of said ideas. And this is kind of a rough start to this book. Now, what are some of these interesting ideas that I talked about? Well, for me, the first interesting idea is just the locations that we're getting. We don't get to see a lot of locations in here in this first issue. However, the thing opens up with four different members of the Legion of Superheroes having to track down an artifact that's been stolen on planet Gotham. There's an entire planet that is basically just Gotham City. I like this idea, and it's not the first time that we've seen it. I remember seeing this in Grant Morrison's Justice League 1 Million series that was set in the 853rd century because it was written by Grant Morrison, and Grant Morrison isn't just going to get crazy. He's going to go for broke with his crazy, so he went further into the future than any other writer had ever gone. And in this future, every member of the Justice League had one planet that they oversaw, and Batman oversaw Pluto, and basically all Pluto was just Gotham City. So I don't know if Benes was being inspired by this idea, but if he was, then that's great. Uh, I'm very happy to see some cool ideas from DC's history being reused in current series out there. I love that. I'm always happy whenever a writer does that. So yeah, we already get from this little hint that there's going to be different locations out there that are going to pay homage to different heroes in different locations, and we're going to see how they're interpreted here in the future. I think that that's awesome. I want to see more of this. And they find the artifact, and the artifact is being taken by Mordru, who is another character from DC's history. He's this wizard who is an immortal. And I love seeing this big, all-powerful wizard now basically being a crime lord in the future. It's something that we've never really seen with that character, but it's awesome. Again, his headquarters is on New Gotham, on Planet Gotham, and he's basically just being a crime lord. It's so fascinating to me, this idea of taking this immortal wizard from DC's history and basically making him like the penguin of the 31st century? 
That's really cool. So they go in there, they grab this artifact, and it's Aquaman's trident. Now, okay, this is another really fascinating idea. That basically, we all know some of the big artifacts from DC's history, especially from now that a lot of the heroes use in the modern day and time, and we're going to see those being treated as lost relics that the Legion has to gather up. Just think about the possibilities there. I mean, like a Green Lantern ring or Wonder Woman's lasso. They could go on the hunt for all of these different items. You know, go on the hunt for like a mother box or the remains of Cyborg. I really like this idea of seeing what the Justice League left behind and how the Legion has to track all that down. That's a really freaking cool idea. I am so happy with where this story is going so far. And that actually plays into what gets revealed about Earth. Now, I'm going to avoid some spoilers in here so that you guys can check this out for yourself if you do sound interested in it, but I do have to explain to you the positives that I felt with this issue. And after they find Aquaman's Triant, they're talking about how, oh yeah, this had control of the oceans. And the planet Earth now isn't really a planet anymore. It's more of a bunch of cities just with big domes over them they're all being connected by tethers to some big energy core. The plant was destroyed, so they came in here and saved whatever cities they could, and now all the cities are just connected together with nothing to contain them all. And they're mentioning, yeah, Earth used to have oceans, and this trident was supposed to be able to control the oceans. Could we possibly use this to reconstruct the Earth? To bring the Earth back together again? That is such a cool idea. The premise of the Legion of Superheroes book is that the Legion has to bring the Earth back together and remake the Earth? That's one of those things that it doesn't sound like it should be the entire premise of the series, but if you want that to be like your first storyline, like the first storyline ends with the Earth has been reformed, that is a great setup for things that could come with this series. When that is the first thing that you do, reform the Earth, man, you have set the stakes high. You have let us know this is the level of stuff you're going to get from every single storyline here. Again, we don't know if that's what they're doing, but it's the feeling that I get from this book. So, okay, cool. I am 100% behind all this. Now we start getting into the negatives in this book, and I know that not everyone is going to feel this way because I'm really just spouting opinions and nobody's going to feel one way or another with everybody's opinions out there. That's how opinions work. But, I know that Bendis still has a lot of people out there who absolutely love the way that he writes dialogue. And he's got a lot of people out there who really don't like the way that he writes dialogue. I remember when I started reading him on Ultimate Spider-Man all those years ago, like 19 freaking years ago, I remember looking at the way that he wrote dialogue and went, I have never seen anybody write dialogue like this. It sounds so natural, it sounds so real, and yet it's so quick and quippy and so clever. I love the way that he writes this dialogue. And then he proceeded to write that dialogue for every character that he writes in every book, except more. Like, I go back and look at some of his early Ultimate Spider-Man things, and I'm like, wow, it kind of feels like he was restraining himself there. And now he just goes into overdrive when he writes dialogue like that. And as I mentioned, one of the cool things about the Legion of Superheroes is that it's not a team of like four people or seven people or even like 12 people. It's a team of like 30 people. And he's putting them all in here. So you have 30 freaking characters being that quippy and that repetitive with their dialogue. And that just, I don't really know of an appropriate way to put this, but interjecting with their dialogue, just jumping in there and interrupting everybody with everything that they're saying so they can add a different thing in there, just so they can have that constant back and forth. And again, I used to look at this dialogue and just think, oh man, that's so realistic, the way that he writes this dialogue. But he's now taking it to that level where I go, you would never hang out with people who interrupt everything that everyone else is saying this often. No one would hang out with people like that. It would drive you insane. No one is able to get a single word of dialogue in when they're all hanging out with each other. And with this many characters in here, it's an overload. It is, it's, it's, it's flames, flames on the side of my face. I have never seen Bendis write his dialogue be this quick and quippy. I was uh, looking at the reviews for this book over on Comic Book Roundup, where they basically just take the reviews of everybody else around the internet, just compile them all together so everybody gets to see what everybody thinks of this series. And I saw one negative review of this book, and it said, 
If you are not a fan of Pindas, you're gonna get a lot of ammunition out of this book. Yeah, because this is the exact thing that I don't like about the way that Bendis writes dialogue, and it's taken to an extreme level. There are so many word bubbles on every page, but only like a fifth of them mean something or are important to the story at all. And you have so many characters here that you are introducing in this first issue. It's important to be able to let your audience get an attachment to them. It is important to give your audience that opportunity to go, oh, so that guy is this guy, and that guy is this guy. Okay, okay, and these people interact like this, and okay, like this, okay, like... You don't have time to be able to give everybody, like, a huge spotlight, but at least give everybody, like, a quick thing. Like, a quick thing that makes them go, oh, okay, so it's like, it's like that guy. Everybody talks exactly the same. Everybody talks exactly the same in their quick, tiny, little, quippy bits of dialogue in here. And it just felt like a massive wasted opportunity. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure that as the series goes along, we're going to get those moments to sit down with everybody. We're going to get those moments to really be introduced to everybody in here. But here in the first issue, when you really needed to give everybody like that little thing to hold on to, I seriously came out of this just going, I don't know who was saying what at points in this book, but I also know it doesn't matter because everybody was talking so the same, you could have given those lines of dialogue to any character in here. And it all would have meant exactly the same. And as I said, you need to be able to give your audience that opportunity to connect to the various characters in this book, even if it is just for like one panel in there. And yet, at the very end of this book, you get the big splash page of all the characters about to charge into battle. And I looked at those characters there and I went, wait a minute. One of those characters is wearing the helmet of Dr. Fate. And one of them has a yellow lantern ring. Oh my gosh, that's some creative stuff to do. That's great stuff to do. With characters set way in the future because yellow lanterns, they're the bad guys. But you know, give it a thousand years, who knows what they're doing. Maybe they are defenders of truth and justice now. That's an awesome thing to throw in there. And the helmet of Dr. Fate, oh wow. What could that possibly mean for this character over here? I didn't even notice that about these characters until we got to the last page for these characters. That feels like something that I should have noticed way earlier in this book. And I went back through and I did look and go, okay, you can kind of see the Helen of Dr. Fake way back there in the background of this big splash page. Okay, well, I guess, I guess they did appear on this page here if I just squint enough and look there. Okay, fine. But no, these are things that you need to give your audience, like those moments of just, here's this person, this person, this person. I mean, I'm not going to come in here and wag a finger if this book decided to just go, all right, let's just get like everybody one panel where they just go, hi, I'm this guy, name pops up and a little brief description, you get like their own way of speaking, that little way of going, okay, here's how they're different, or like, you know, a little bit of something that makes you go, oh, okay, well, they're speaking in an interesting way, or they made mention of something, I wonder what this could possibly mean for the future. I wouldn't be upset if they just decided to do that. I mean, in a lot of other books out there, you could look at that and possibly say it's lazy, but when you have 30 freaking characters to introduce your audience to all at once, yeah, it wouldn't be a bad idea to go that route. I wouldn't blame you for doing that. But here we just got nothing. Like I said, Sinestro Ring, Helmet of Dr. Fate, didn't even know that they were in this issue until the very end. And I should go ahead and mention this right now. now go ahead, mention this right freaking now. This book did have two issues, Legion of Superheroes Millennium, that were meant to be a lead up to this book sort of question mark i didn't read those and the reason i didn't read those was because i asked around online and everybody i asked said you do not need to read these everybody that i checked with online whether it be reviewers whether it just be random people on twitter whether it just whether it just be you know people that i knew who had read these books they all said no these do not feel important at all in any way shape or form now again i didn't read them so maybe they were exaggerating maybe you did need to read these Maybe those issues did give you everything that you need to know about these characters. But this is issue number one. This is the issue that most people are jumping in on. If you did give us that stuff in those issues, you need to do a better job of coming in here in this issue and catching everybody up who skipped those issues. And really, to me, that's the most disappointing part of all this. Because with Legion of Superheroes, because you've got 30 freaking members 
all from different plants, all with crazy different backstories to each other. There is so much possibility here. Getting to write a Legion of Superheroes book is basically like just being handed a giant toy box and being told, dig in there, find whatever toys you want. Heck, if you want to pull some toys apart and reassemble them however you want, you're just being handed Legos. That's what you're being handed here. You're being handed a bunch of Legos. And I feel like they just didn't do anything in this issue with it. I feel like there was nothing there. There's like one member of the team who says, oh, well, it's time that I finally told you about my father. And I went, well, okay, sure, I guess. All right, all right, backstory, backstory. All right, yeah, all right, cool. Give me something, give me something to be attached to you. But then everybody just keeps jumping in there. Just keeps injecting a different line of dialogue in there just to make like some little quip. And you've got like nine people doing that at once that I just, his, whatever it was that he wanted to say in that moment, it just got lost in the massive sea of quips. It was so hard for me to care about anybody in here when I didn't really get any kind of connection to any of them. And anytime that someone tried to give me a connection to any of them, it was just being drowned out by everyone else in this book. Uh, yeah, this is not giving me a lot of faith for the future of this book. And at the moment, it's getting pretty decent reviews, but I've been in this game a long time. I know how Bendis books work. First issues always get decent reviews, and then after a couple issues, people are like, oh, uh, nothing's really happening with this book, and it's all just kind of meh now. And man, this absolutely kind of gave me that feeling, because I look at this and went, oh, there are some interesting ideas. I would love to see what's going to happen with these interesting ideas, but I know from experience, I'm going to lose interest in these interesting ideas, because they're just going to get drowned out by all these characters who I just really can't form that connection with. It's going, to be, it's going to get drowned out by just endless word bubbles full of quips over and over and over again. And just so much repetition. There is so much repetition in the dialogue in this book. Even by Binda's standards, there's so much repetition in this dialogue. So, yeah, it's, it's a shame. It is a real shame uh, that this issue, it just, it couldn't do anything for me. And I feel like when it comes to the Legion of Superheroes, there's so much that can be done with them. Especially considering, as I said, the personality of this team. The thing that I felt was lacking from the characters in this book. Because that was always the thing that interested me in the Legion of Superheroes when I was a kid. It's that I would look at this wide selection of characters, and every single one of them seemed different. Every single one of them seemed like they had their own thing going on. Every single one of them seemed like they had something distinct about them and they spoke in a different way and they had their own different backstories and their own different attitudes and their own different way of connecting with everybody out there and you just get nothing in this issue. Uh, I mean, again, you don't get the time to get one-on-one -on -one moments with each of them so maybe when you get that you'll be able to see that these characters are different from each other but this first issue gave me nothing of that. Uh, and really, I feel like I should keep going on, keep describing what happens in here. I've kind of already done it. I mean, I didn't want to spoil this entire issue, but this issue is light. For a book that is jam-packed with so much dialogue, this thing was over with. This thing was pretty much just set up, done. Okay. The, we have so much dialogue in here. And yet I feel like nothing was accomplished in this issue. It's, yeah, this is a, uh, this is a big mess up. And I hate saying that because I hate being negative about any book on here. I feel like there's too much negativity in the comic book community on YouTube, but man, this is the big release this week. I had to come in here. I had to talk about it. I had to give you guys my thoughts on it. My thoughts are that this thing is not very good. It's not. I hate saying that. I do. It hurts. But that's it. Those are my thoughts on Legion of Superheroes number one. And I feel like this is going to be a short episode. But the fact that I can talk endlessly about almost any issue out there, and yet I'm wrapping this thing up so quickly, I think it kind of sums up my viewpoints on this issue. When even I can't figure out stuff to say about your book without just repeating myself over and over and over again, yeah, man, it is not really worth picking up. Ben, people have always described Ben as, as being a writer who is far better in trade, and I absolutely agree with that. Because this is a guy who is not afraid to have an entire issue where nothing's really accomplished because he really just wanted to have characters talk back and forth to each other. That's what this issue is. But this is an issue like 27 of the Legion of Superheroes. This is issue one. 
you don't do that in issue number one. But that's it. Another episode of Comic Class in the bag. Let me know what you thought about Legion of Superheroes number one in the comments down below or on Twitter and Twitch at Professor Thorgy. And if you like this video, make sure that you hit that thumb up button because apparently that does a thing here on YouTube and I'm supposed to tell you all to do that. So I have now done that. Uh, coming up next week. Next week. We are going to be sitting down and talking about every single one of the brand new Dawn of X books. For the people who are part of our Patreon, you already got a little bit of a preview of that as I talked about X-Men number one over there for like half a freaking hour. Which again, that's another one of those books that I was like, oh man, I don't really have a lot to say about this issue. And then half an hour later, I was still going about that issue. So I don't know how we're going to squeeze like six brand new series into one single episode of Comic Class, but... We'll give it our best shot. Tune back in next week to see if I accomplish that. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Come back next time. Bye.